Christmas Eve Eve, everybody. You excited? It didn't sound very excited. Is it because all the kids are in children's ministry? What's going on? Christmas Eve Eve. I don't know about you guys. December feels like it has gone by in the, in the, in the just, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Blink of an eye, right. See, you guys were more on top of that than you were on uh, Christmas Eve Eve. Killing me. Uh, so, Everything is moving so fast, which is one of the reasons I have been really thankful for this Advent series that we've been doing. It's kind of been giving us, I think, a little bit of space to slow things down and, and really kind of recenter, refocus uh, our attention on Jesus where it should be, um, remembering that this is about his coming and looking forward to him coming again. Uh, candles, a nice visual reminder. Um, I hope that it's been a blessing to you like it has been to me. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and start finding your way to Matthew chapter 2. We'll be on the screen if you don't have one with you. Um, this, this morning, our, our theme is seek, and you can probably guess uh, what part of the story that's coming from. The wise men, a story that I think we all know and hopefully love. Um, something that really struck me this week as I was preparing for this message was that as familiar as these characters are to us, there is actually surprisingly little that we know about them, uh, particularly from the biblical passage. Um, again, as familiar as this story and these characters are, we, we really know shockingly little about them. So, and maybe even the things that we do think we know about them might not be correct. <laughs> so, Matthew 2, starting in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring, him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for your people gathered together this morning. Uh, what, a, what an awesome thing that is. We, we, we ask that through your spirit, you would uh, move in us. You would um, just open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts to what you have for us, the uh, things that you would desire to show us and teach us and uh, change in us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think it can be difficult sometimes to grasp the significance of a moment in history with only a sentence or two to go on. Now, one such moment that I want to talk about a little bit this morning is uh, kind of circling around this word troubled. Now, we have a large spectrum of uses in uh, our everyday language for the word trouble. Could be anything as trivial as having trouble with a hangnail to when we talk about a person who is troubled, we might re be referring to someone who's committed mass murder. So the word translated troubled in the text this morning does not mean simply annoyed or perturbed. It is a word that is used to describe intense agitation, like physical turbulence, something that causes anxiousness and distress. Another usage is to strike fear and dread in one's spirit. So the same word translated troubled in our text this morning is used elsewhere in scripture to describe the disciples' reaction when they saw Jesus walking on the water. Now, if you remember in that story, they thought he was a ghost. It was the middle of the night. And this word that we have troubled here was actually translated terrified there, as in scared out of their minds. Now, you might be thinking this is a terrible introduction to a Christmas message. <laughs> There's a reason. Uh, so in verse 3, it does say that Herod and all of Jerusalem 
were agitated, they were distressed, they were anxious. Why? Why was the whole city, the king included, so nervous? Is it really because three old guys rode into town on camels? Every Christmas card, Christmas painting, nativity scene that I've, I've ever witnessed, I've never seen anything look like it should strike fear into the heart of a king and his city. So maybe, just maybe, we, we might need to adjust our idea of these wise men. For starters, we'll stop calling them the wise men and we'll call them magi. So the actual Greek word is magos, which uh, is translated wise men in, in a lot of different versions of the Bible. Now, Dr. John MacArthur actually says this is a word that it's not really a translatable word. It's more the name of a tribe of people. So it's a, it's, it's a tribe of people rather than just uh, a word that you can translate. And I think it's really helpful to think about it in that, in that way, in those terms. So it was a very ancient tribe of people. The book of Daniel talks about the Magi in the king's court when he was there. They were trusted advisors to uh, different rulers, different empires. They were astrologers, ma uh, magicians. That's actually where we get the word magic from. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here too. The, the Bible does not uh, speak a lot to kind of this, this historical background information on the Magi. So a lot of what we know about them comes from extra biblical ancient historians. So some of the things that we, have, we, we gather from that is that they were uh, in some circles believed to be a super kind of powerful, uh, almost cabal like the Illuminati. We, knew, we, we do know that they were a powerful group of people. And we also know that they had a function uh, that, that in, in the pagan world was, was not super dissimilar as the Levites did for the people of Israel. They were almost like, a, like they had a priestly function in their, in, their, uh, in their people group. And they were found at the highest levels of power. We know that. And it's fascinating because we see this actually in different empires. So not just the ancient empire of Babylon, but also the Medo-Persians. One of the most noteworthy things I think about that whole thing is that when the Israelites were exiled, Daniel would have been in, in, in that group, when, uh, when they were exiled to Babylon, remember in the, in the book of Daniel, he, he interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar, and it was a dream that none of the other magicians or, or advisors could interpret, and Daniel did, and he's put in charge of all the court magicians. Daniel's put, put at the top. So that group of people that Daniel was put in charge of is this same group of people that uh, are the Magi. And why is that significant? Because that was 600 years before the birth of Jesus. So 600 years before Jesus' birth, there was this pronounced Jewish presence in the courts of the king. And the, this guy, Daniel, who would just as soon be fed to lions than not practice his religion, his faith, do you think he, he would have not shared about the God that he worshipped with those people that were now under him. So the Magi survived these transitions from empire to empire, Babylon, Persia, Greek, Rome. Now, this is about kind of glancing over about two years worth of, uh, of, of his world history. So if there's any history majors uh, in here, I'm sorry. Um, but even after the, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire fell to the Greeks, the Magi didn't go away. They, they still, they kind of consolidated their power on the eastern fringe of the empire. What used to be Persia kind of became uh, the Parthian Empire, and that's not going to be uh, something you need to write on your notes, but just know that they were kind of a thorn in Rome's side for a long time. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of skirmishes, animosity that happened between those two empires. So one historian writes that the, the Magi had become so powerful that no Persian was ever able to become a king except under two conditions. One, he had to master the scientific and religious discipline of the Magi, and two, he had to be approved and crowned by the Magi. So here's the bottom line. The Magi in Jesus' day were not just wandering around following a star. They were into the stars, no doubt, but that probably wasn't, wasn't the heart of their quest. The Magi literally had the power to crown someone king. They literally could appoint a king. Which is the first point if you are filling in the blanks. The Magi sought a king. 
So they were, they were searching for a king and they found Jesus, which is pretty cool. A few more things about the Magi. There were probably not three of them. Now, I think the tradition is easy to accept because there were three gifts, so we, we, won't, we, we won't fight about that too much, but it's, it's pretty unlikely that there were exactly three Magi. Could have been two, could have been 20. But the thing that's really important, I think, to consider is not just the Magi themselves, but the, the entourage, the people that they traveled with. Because let's say, let's say there were three Magi, right? Just for old time's sake, we'll say there's three. They certainly would have had an escort, a large escort, to make that kind of journey, that kind of mission. Some historians think it could have possibly even been over a thousand. Now, there, there's a story that uh, historians think they probably exaggerated, but the, the Parthians at one point had to escort a, uh, a consulate from the Far East through their territory, and they claim to have used 20,000 mounted cavalry uh, just uh, as, a, as a show of pomp. So it's not hard to imagine that maybe these, these magi were traveling with a large contingent of cavalry. So the next thing is this idea that they were riding camels. They, uh, also, that is not likely. So the Parthians had these Persian horses. That was something that, that was kind of their, one of the things that, that was their claim to fame is they, they had these really skilled horse, horseback riding archers and they had... Um, these uh, armored uh, armor for their horses. So they were riders, they were horses, they were armored. Uh, and, uh, and you can imagine if hundreds, if not a thousand of these armed horses came into town unexpected one day. So that's the kind of display of this convoy entering Jerusalem, marching up to the palace and asking, where's the new king? I think that the closest thing we could imagine that to today would be if you looked out your window and there was a, a, an armored tank brigade coming right down your street. No wonder Herod was troubled and the entire city was troubled with him. Now, I haven't seen that on a Christmas card either or in a nativity scene. Now, you might be wondering what the deal is. Why the history lesson, right, Eric? I mean, it's interesting, right? Horses, not camels, three, 10, 20, we don't know. Ancient Magi tribe, they sound a little bit like Jedis, right? <laughs> Here's why it's important. Because it was important to Matthew. Matthew, the author of this gospel, it was the only gospel author who included this in his account. And he did it because he wanted to show people that Jesus is the true and forever king of God's people, right? Jesus, Matthew's primary audience was Jews, and he was proving to them that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the king in the line of David that would rule forever. So when the Magi found Jesus, I'd be willing to bet that he wasn't exactly what they expected. But even if it was unexpected, they still recognized him recognized what was going on, and they responded appropriately. They fell down and they worshipped him. Which is amazing when you think about all the other stuff going on. And so I think one of the reasons that the, the Magi have been such a, a, an integral part of our nativity tradition is that we are intrigued by this story. There's, you know, some kind of mystique. They travel from afar. But I think it's more than that. I think we are captivated by their seeking, because we are also seekers, right? Yeah, second point is we seek God. And what I mean by that, it's kind of a general, generalized term, but there seems to be something hardwired in all people. All human beings share something inside of us that causes us to, to seek something outside of ourselves. And what I mean by that is that as Christians, we believe that People are aware that there is more going on in existence than flesh and blood. More to life than meets the eye. Consciousness is not just neurons and cells and biochemical reactions. I mean, people can go their entire lives and not acknowledge it. But that doesn't mean that people don't realize at some point in their life, something is missing 
and they try to fix it with something else. Now, in Ecclesiastes, it says that God puts eternity into the hearts of men, which is kind of a beautiful way to say that. Fallen creatures, though we are, everybody at some point has to ask the deep questions. So for some of us here today, maybe that's, maybe that's where we're at. We're at the start. We're not sure there's a God. We don't know what to make of Jesus. If that's you, I'm glad you're here. Ask questions before you leave. We're happy to talk about Jesus any chance we get. For others of us this morning, probably most of us, we have realized we are creatures who need our creator. We believe in God. We try to seek him diligently like the Magi did. We try to seek the good spiritual things. We try, we work, we search, we seek. We want to be better and do better, look better. But at some point, I think we all have to face the uncertainty that we might not be sure that we've been good enough or have done enough good. You know, the Magi would have been very familiar with the law of Moses and Old Testament worship. They would have been uh, familiar with the idea of the sacrifices and the Day of Atonement and the Ten Commandments. They would know about the Levitical priests who mediated between God and his people. And they would know about his people. They, they would know firsthand about God's people because God's people had been taken to Babylon because they continually ran away from him. Continually failed, continually disobeyed, continually rebelled. And so the Magi were in search of a king. And I have to believe that when they got there, they, they had at least some glimpse of what God was doing in the big picture in history. They knew the God of Israel. They knew, who, they knew about him. They knew of his holiness and his perfection. They knew of his justice and his love. They, they, they knew him. They knew of him. They recognized his glory. They knew of him, but they did not know him until they saw Jesus. And they fell down and worshiped him. They must have realized that for all of their experience in different religions, searching and seeking, that there was something special about a God who was actually seeking them, who came to them, and they worshipped him. What else could they do? And I would ask the same question of us this morning. Because three, God is seeking you. Jesus says in Luke 19.10, I came to seek and save the lost. You might be at a place in your life where you feel like you're doing pretty, pretty well seeking after the things of the Lord. And that's good. But we all need to remember that it was God who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It was God who carried us through times of doubt and pain or guilt it was God who did not give up on us, not the other way around. And maybe you're in a place this morning where uh, you're not even sure why you're here. Maybe you're not sure if you're a very good Christian or maybe even a Christian at all. But God is seeking you as well. In all our desperate searching and seeking and grasping, for things that we know ultimately will not satisfy us. Here we see a God who is seeking after us. Because that is the great news of Christmas, right? Like that's the glad tidings of great joy. That we were never going to get to God on our own. So God came down to us. And our response should be the same as the Magi. To worship him. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, again, we are, um, we're thankful for what you are doing in the world. We are thankful for uh, your, your church gathered together. Lord, we're, we're thankful that, um, that you are a God who seeks. That, um, Lord, when we were powerless to respond to your goodness, powerless to, uh, to, to understand your, 
your grace and your love to us, uh, that you, you, came, you came to us. So Lord, I, I pray for each uh, person in this room, each heart in this room, um, God, that you would, um, that you would impress, you would impress uh, the magnitude of your love uh, here at Christmas time uh, on us, and uh, and that we would respond appropriately uh, in worship and thankfulness for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, Amen.